Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Phil Goldberg. Phil's an old friend of mine. We go back 40 years, which is probably two thirds of our life. <laughs> uh, we were on the same. We were both from the East Coast. He from New York. I from Connecticut. And we were on the same uh, course in 1970, becoming teachers of transcendental meditation. Um, Phil has been a, a writer most of his adult life and um, written a number of books. We're going to talk about a couple of them t today, but in particular, American Veda, which is his most recent book, From Emerson to, and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West. And uh, I, I, you know, I started out this show, I was just sort of interviewing people here in Fairfield, Iowa, who uh, said they had had a spiritual awakening. And then I, I kind of went to Skype and started interviewing people around the world, uh, many of whom uh, are teachers of some sort. Um, you know, they've made teaching their gig, and uh, you know, teach uh, spiritual teachers. And some people sort of complained about that. She said, "What about the regular people? I liked it when you just did regular people." Uh, and then there's also a third category developing, which is people who don't, who aren't necessarily spiritual teachers, nor claim to have had a spiritual awakening, um, who. But are interesting to talk to and who shed light on the theme of this of this uh, show, uh, which is ordinary people who've had a spiritual awakening. Um, so books, uh, Phil's book. People run out of them after a while. <laughs> no, they keep <laughs> popping up. Um, <laughs> I've got a long list actually. Question is how to prioritize them. Um, but um, Phil's book definitely sheds light on this because when we speak of spiritual awakening, uh, we usually mean that in a sort of an Eastern sense, you know, in the sen in terms of enlightenment or that sort of awakening. Uh, and if Eastern teachers and, and philosophies hadn't influenced the West as they have, we probably wouldn't be using such terminology, although it's you know, arguable that people would still be having awakenings, but they might d define them differently. Uh, but in any case, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so, I, I wanted to just start with a couple of big picture points because your whole your whole uh, book is about how Indian spirituality has influenced the West, and uh, according to Indian tradition, there was a time when Vedic civilization was global. And it was eventually lost and kind of shrunken down to just you know the Indian subcontinent. Uh, but that's an interesting kind of consideration. It's, it's sort of like <laughs> if that's true, then there's, then we'll, all we're experiencing here is a reintroduction. Um, uh -huh. And another interesting point is, um, gee, I forgot my second point. So forget about it. Let's, <laughs> let's <laughs> it'll come back to me. Uh, why don't you t give us a sketch about your book, Phil, uh, uh, kind of a nutshell. Well, um, I, I'm agnostic on whether there was a Vedic civilization that was global. Yeah, who knows? Uh, I do, we do know that in, in more recent times, like a few thousand years ago, uh, there was contact with, with Europeans and, and India. There's wonderful anecdotes about Alexander the Great having his mind blown when he reached the Himalayas and met some yogis who were not terribly impressed by someone who wanted to conquer the world. <laughs> but my the story I tell in American Veda really begins uh, about 200 years ago with uh, Emerson, when or prior to Emerson's emergence as a, as a well-known thinker, uh, when he was a child, really, and, and the first uh, sympathetic translations of, of Vedic texts and first uh, uh, sympathetic commentaries were coming into New England uh, from from Europe uh, via ship, and people in the, you know the sort of educated elite in New England, like Emerson's father, who was a Unitarian minister, were reading these books, and so Emerson grew up with them, and they had a, a profound impact on on his. Uh, emergence as a thinker and philosopher and and literary genius um, and and as I say in the in the book if if he was the only person ever to have been affected by Indian spiritual teachings it would the effect still would have been profound because it had a huge effect on him and and he had a huge effect on on the the uh, em evolution of American philosophy, American thinking, American literature, and so forth. But that's where my story begins. 
And what I attempt to do in the book is um, convey uh, this sort of um, story of how these Vedic uh, streams and tributaries from the different teachers and the different books and the different yoga masters and gurus and everybody who came here found their way into the uh, culture beginning with sort of elites and counterculture type of people and then into the mainstream and and the subtle ways that these threads uh, weave kind of into the fabric of the culture from the principal sources and then through secondary sources who are influenced by the teachings and then influence others in a minor way people like you and me and, and probably everybody uh, watching this and in a major way by uh, people who become very famous and become sort of Vedic uh, disseminators themselves and there's there's a, a lot of those people you know, and, and we can probably you will talk about some of them I'm sure but that's what the book is about and I contend that the impact on, on America has been far greater than people realize and it's affected um, not only the obvious people like people watching this who are interested in enlightenment and whose lives were, were powerfully uh, transformed by these teachings, but by ordinary people whose you know, doctors tell them to meditate or whose psychotherapists uh, practice therapy differently because they've been influenced uh, by Vedic teachings or uh, because their uh, professor teaching comparative religion spent a few years in an ashram and has a different perspective on things. Uh, and so on and so forth, and, and the, the incidents of these kind of things throughout the culture are enormous. Well, it, it certainly, you know, in reading your book, and I'm about a third of the way through it now, because um, we, we rescheduled this interview and kind of moved it up, but uh, it's had more of an influence than I had realized, and, and I've been into this stuff for, you know, for over four decades. I mean, I was amazed as I read how many uh, well-known literary people and academics of, and even politicians um, had been influenced by, you know, whether Emerson or Swami Vivekananda or, you know, various um, various sources of, of wisdom from the East. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really obviously had an impact. You used the word sympathetic a few minutes ago. Uh, was that to say that um, th er earlier... Uh, translations of Vedic scriptures were um, intentionally uh, distorted in order to make them look like pagans or, or you know? You can say that. Uh, I, I used the term intentionally because it was not so much translations because translations didn't start coming until people uh, learned Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, all the, all the commentary, all the sort of travelogues and, you know, people writing about India, were pretty much in the service of either of, of the of one of the three M's that I call mercenaries, missionaries, and militaries. Uh -huh. And so, you, and so during the British Raj, uh, scholars were sort of uh, their assignment was to uh, demonstrate to to get to know the Indian religion and give uh, in order to debunk it. Well, not only to debunk it, but to to demonstrate the need for these people, the Christians, to have a civilizing influence of, right. of British administration and Christian uh, missionary work. Yeah, because they, you know, and so it justified uh, the missionary effort and it justified the colonial effort. That was the that was their assignment. But there were a few people who broke through that and said. Uh, why are we trying to convert these people? They have something to teach us. Yeah, and and those those started to get published uh, mm -hmm. at that time. Was it Rudyard Kipling who said, "East is east, and west is west, and never the twain yeah. shall meet"? Huh? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I I was, he was thinking. Wrong. Of, yeah, he probably <laughs> said that. You know, because in, when he first when he went to India, the, the culture must have seemed so you know radically different than his own that he couldn't imagine emerging. You know, or a synthesis of of east and west, but obviously, as transportation and communications have increased, that was bound to happen, and it's, right. and it's gone in both directions. I mean, you know, India is very te technologically savvy these days. Yes, not on, but it's not only that. I mean, if you look at the thread of teachers who who came here and had the biggest impact, 
beginning with Swami Vivekananda and and uh, in the in the 1890s, and then you know into into the 20th century with all the gurus and swamis we're familiar with, they were all educated in British schools hmm. or or with British influence. They were all very fluent in English. They were they were all very familiar with science. They were all very familiar with Darwinian theory and and the sort of philosophy of the Western Enlightenment, so called. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to um, adapt these ancient and traditional teachings to the modern era because they had been influenced by the West themselves. And the modernizing influence that uh, started to take root in India affected their thinking, and they were very smart and very skillful in, in, in not only uh, package, p using the term packaging sounds like, you know, it was crass, but uh, it, interpreting and translating and presenting. presenting, offering these texts in ways that the West could... Uh, it, it could be accommodated and be appealing to to the sort of Western rational, pragmatic, empirical mindset, uh, and 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 so the influence went both ways, even in this transmission. Yeah, like for instance, in your book, you said that you know these teachers would not emphasize the sort of the ritualistic uh, things. Or Swami Vivekananda didn't play up the fact that his guru was a Kali worshiper, exactly. uh, <laughs> and also they were quick to emphasize that this is not going to replace your religion, it's only going to yes. enhance it. Yes, and that was a big deal, I mean, because um, this was the opposite of the missionary effort that was going on in India, which they've always resented, and, and even Vivekananda in the 1890s spoke out against. They were all to a person. All the gurus who came here made a point of saying, we're not teaching you... Uh, to, we're not trying to get you to convert to Hinduism. You can be a better Christian or Jew or whatever by uh, practicing these techniques. And even if you're secular, even if you're not religious, you can look at these as self-improvement practices and, and as a philosophy. So Vivekananda didn't start the Hinduism society. He started the Vedanta society. And Maharishi didn't teach Hindu meditation. He taught TM and and made it, uh, you know, a, an educational organization. And that's the way they presented it. And that had a big impact. If you go to some of these um, lineages, you'll see pictures of Jesus on the altar and, you know, people speaking very highly of Jesus, distinguishing him as a great yogi or avatar who they honor uh, from, from church, churchy stuff. But uh, that was part of their appeal, too. Yeah. Um, some critics would argue that it was a sort of a, a deceptive uh, approach because many people didn't en did end up becoming very Indianized. You know, they became yes. they became swamis. They adopted Indian names. I mean, here in Fairfield, Iowa, there are two Mother Divine temples. <laughs> <laughs> of all places, I we, I'm in L.A. where you know it, uh, you expect that sort of thing. So no, you're right, and but that was you know that was an option. None of, the, none of the teachers made it, you know, with some exceptions. But there were always these sort of um, layers of involvement that you could choose. You could just be a participant, like, you know, to use TM as an example, because that, that's what we did. You know, people could just learn to meditate for whatever reason. They didn't have to get involved with anything uh, organizational or deeper than that. On the other hand, some people became so immersed in it that they became almost, you know, like disciples in the classic sense of the word. And in other teaching lineages, there are, as you said, people made swamis and people taking vows and people becoming, uh, you know, sworn devotees of a lineage and so forth. So that option was there. But at the same time, most of those people wouldn't call themselves Hindus. True. That's and, a very and interesting... And, and no one ever said to them, you know, become a Hindu or you're going to hell. Uh, certainly not. Or, and no one ever said become a Hindu and, or else you can't uh, take full advantage of this stuff. You, it was just not necessary. I mean, to this day, if you go back to the first teaching organization that got established in America, which was the one Vivekananda started, when they initiate somebody into their form of meditation and, and, and the person becomes a, a, an initiate, they give them the option of choosing, you know, their own 
Ishta Devata, and if Jesus or Mary is their chosen form of of uh, devotion, then that's perfectly fine with them. Yeah, Ama, Amachi does the same thing. She gives, yeah. she initiates people and gives them mantras. And if they say they want it to be based on Jesus or Mary right. or whatever, she'll give them a mantra with that incorporated into it. Yeah, it's very common. Mm -hmm. And and <clears throat> you know they'll all celebrate Christmas and Easter uh, in in a very sincere way. It's not <clears throat> not it was not a cynical kind of thing. Like when Yogananda first <laughs> set up his headquarters in LA, he started having Sunday services. Mm -hmm. And if you go to them now, it's like Hindu Presbyterian <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> on Sunday morning. But it wasn't sort of cynical. It was, that's what Americans do. They go, that's when they're, you know, spiritual. So he did it on Sunday morning and, and patterned it after <laughs> what they're what they're accustomed to. Yeah, and I mean, this, and this is all very sort of in keeping with the way uh, the Vedic civilization works. I mean, the, it's it's all embracing, it's all inclusive. They right. sort of, and I mean, in the Gita, Krishna says something like, you know, "Howsoever a man worships me, I accept that." You know, and and you know, implying that it could be some some bit in a jungle village in Africa worshipping some god as he understands it but you know the all embracing godhead uh, recognizes and accepts that in whatever form it's offered right so that that verse in the Rig Veda which is often quoted that's usually translated uh, truth is one the wise call it by many names mm -hmm. um, you know in those days it meant well you, you worship Shiva or Vishnu or you know Surya or whatever but then as the world got globalized, it also came to include Islam and Judaism and Christianity. And anything pursued in an authentic and deep way would be acceptable, you know, in, in, to the Vedic tradition. Yeah. Um, I, I start my, my day out every day when I turn on my computer by downloading the latest photo from NASA, uh, which they offer these beautiful high-resolution photos. Uh -huh. of, it, usually it's some galaxies or nebulas or something like that. And it just reminds me of how vast the universe is beyond conception and what a tiny speck our planet is, you know. It's, yeah. it's just infinitesimally small in comparison to the, the vastness of... And, and if you... Devotional astronomy. Yeah, it's really. And if you believe, as I do, that, <laughs> that, that the universe is teeming with life, then, uh, you know, this wisdom that we're calling Vedic or Eastern or something like that is really so fundamental in my understanding that it's not even human wisdom, you know. It's, it, there, there could be beings elsewhere in the universe who we wouldn't call human, but who are highly evolved in the way we understand that to mean, who are, you know, kind of conversing in the same terms and experiencing the same things through their particular nervous systems. No doubt, but I'll, I'll, uh, my book does not cover uh, <laughs> other other galaxies. <laughs> we're, we're focused on America. Not that'll be the Europe. that'll be the sequel. Huh? The sequel is Europe, and then part three will be the, rest of the galaxy. Uh, but but but, one's, but your point reminds me of another reason that the uh, the teachings that came here uh, found such a receptive audience, and that is their compatibility with science. Yeah. There was never any of this, you know, split between faith and reason or, you know, science and religion like there is in the West. The, you know, the, all the great teachers embraced evolution and, 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 and you know, the, the scientific methodology and so forth. Yeah, I think I, I was reading just last night, I think you were referring to the interviews with Bill Moyers and uh, what's his name? Uh, Houston Smith, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, and, and Bill Moyers asked him something about what he believed, and, and, and Campbell said, it doesn't matter what I believe, what matters is what I experience. Right, right. And that, that is one of the real principal you know, uh, teachings that, that has taken root in America, because the, the sort of shift that the Eastern traditions brought that what matters is the, du the direct experience of the divine, not belief systems or, or uh, creeds or, you know, those things become secondary. That has really taken root in America and not just uh, with the obvious people who are meditating and going to yoga studios and all that, but with the mainstream. If, if you look at religious surveys, uh, among just you know a, a random samples of Americans, the shift to experiential spirituality over the last 
40 or so years has been extraordinary. And I think that, you know, that's one of the, the chief contributions that were made by the teachers from the East. Do you think that's what people mean when they say, well, I'm spiritual but not religious? I think that the term... Yeah, I, was, I gave a talk last night and this came up and I said, you know, there were probably always people who were spiritual but not religious. Probably Emerson was the prototype American, Emerson and Thoreau, for being spiritual but not religious. They sort of rejected mainstream religion and went on their own individual paths and encouraged everybody else to do so, informed in large part by the Gita and other texts that they were reading. But there was no term for it, and now it's a religious category. Now it's, you know, it, it, and it's the fastest growing religious category in America. And I think that being spiritual but not religious in a real sense would have been uh, inconceivable without the teachings that came here. Because if you don't have a practice, and if you don't have an intellectual framework about what it means to be spiritual and what, what that uh, brings to your life, and if you don't have practices to make that a reality, then it's, it's just sort of stargazing. And, and it's, it's, it's you know, something ephemeral. But I think the emergence and the, um, the uh, acceptance and the permeation of these teachings Gave, made it possible for people who were uh, alienated from traditional religion or turned off by it or you know, had difficulty with it in some way to be spiritual in a, in a um, structured and, and authentic context uh, without having to sacrifice their, their integrity or their, you know, sign on to a belief system that they, you know, didn't uh, feel comfortable with or any of that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, letting the dog in here. Come on. Okay. <laughs> um, now, that is not to this say, of course... doesn't happen on Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a bigger budget. <laughs> he gets paid for what he does. <laughs> Have you been on Charlie Rose? No, but uh, this we're we're sending out a hint to. The yeah, it doesn't happen on Oprah either. <laughs> um, now you know I don't think either of us is implying that um, you know traditional religion is without its experiential dimension. No, um, I mean, first of all, there have been great mystics in in uh, you know throughout religious history in probably every religion um, sure. who you know ha had levels of experience that modern new age you know spiritual seekers would envy um, uh, but there was actually a, a division in the early days of the christian church um, there 's a guy named what was his name? Irenaeus or something like that who uh, there was this tussle between the sort of mystical inner directed experientially oriented people and the, the more doctrinaire you know Bible is literal you know just believe in the word so on type of people and the latter won out um, yeah they sure did <laughs> but, but but there's now and and you're right of course and and none of the, I would not denigrate the the fact that any uh, individual could go to a church or synagogue and have a transcendent experience or be walking in the woods and have a transcendent experience independent of really we all know that that is not only possible but does happen but the odds are against it if you don't have you know a genuine uh, spiritual practice that you that you do and and if you don't have a teaching that encourages it, and and those things were kind of lost to the Western religion. So in our generation, when we came of age and started to, you know, become seekers of truth and 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 self transformation, uh, those it wasn't available. It wasn't really um, happening. And so we, you know, the East made that a priority, and there it was being offered to us. As a result of that. The, there's been a tremendous revival of mystical Christianity and mystical Judaism, especially in the last 20 or 30 years. And one of, one of the chapters you haven't got to <laughs> in American Veda talks about that uh, because um, you, you start with people like Thomas Merton who were uh, 
being influenced by Asian texts and Buddhist and Hindu Hindu literature, and then uh, started corresponding with with teachers in that, those traditions. And people like Bede Griffiths, and you know a whole bunch of rabbis and other uh, Christian other Christian leaders. They looked to the East and said something's of value here. And then in the 70s, the 60s and 70s, when people like us were, you know, going off to India and being with gurus, a lot of the Christian and Jewish leaders, as, as you know, said, uh, why? Why are these people turning away from us and going to these Asian teachers? Um, and, and as the, the result of that, of the investigation of some of those people, like Father Thomas Keating and certain rabbis, was to say, we can learn from these teachings and adapt them to our Christian tradition or our Jewish tradition. And in fact, let's look into the lost uh, materials in those traditions and see if we can revive them and make them available to lay people. And so now there's, you know, if you look, uh, Google Jewish meditation or Christian meditation, there's a ton of stuff that uh, centering prayer, for example, which was, you know, sort of based on the TM teaching procedures. And, you know, there's people meditating who, because of, of rabbis who were seekers like us in the 60s and 70s and learned to, to practice meditation through a guru or an, you know, a year in an ashram or whatever, they now teach Jewish meditation using Hebrew instead of Sanskrit huh. as mantras. Yeah. They, they've adapted what they learned to the, to the, the, the tradition that they came back and re-embraced. I mean, I've, I've interviewed a number of such people. It's fascinating. Hmm. It's interesting. It almost seems like, well, I'm, I imagine there will always be cultural distinctions and diversities, but it, it's, it's kind of curious to speculate as to how far this will go, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But who knows? <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I'm always asked to make predictions because I wrote a book. Yeah, and it's like I don't want to go there. It's just like this seems to be the direction of evolution. Yeah, I, you know, whatever form it takes, uh, it, it will have the characteristics of being more genuinely inclusive, more genuinely independent, and more genuinely interdirected and experiential. Yeah, and you know, with and non -dual. I'm sorry, and not dual, and non dual. Yeah, that it, you know, that's you know, there'll be this genuine. Non, there's a genuine non dualism emerging where. Um, that includes the duality of devotion mm. and the awareness of ultimate unity in, at the same time. I want to talk about the whole non-dual Neo-Advaita thing as we go along, but um, I just wanted to kind of mention that, uh, you know, it's just like the Eskimos have like 30 words for snow, you know, uh, and in, in the East, there is... In, in India, there's all this subtle knowledge of of fine distinctions in experience and and you know f various components of the subtle personality and so forth. They've really mapped it out and understood it very uh, you know subtly and and thoroughly. Whereas in the West, it was you know that sort of understanding was really rather vague and blunt. And yeah. uh, you know and so I think what you're saying is that that, that sort of emphasis on Inner exploration has been the essential gift of of the East That's to the right. West so far. Sure, uh, sure. And, and rather than you know, and to to recapitulate, to, rather than just sort of toss aside one's religion, the religions are kind of waking up to that possibility. Perhaps even in their right. own tradition. I mean, Jewish tradition has the Baal Shem Tov, right, who was a great mystic, and yeah, and all the Kabbalists. Yeah. And and you mentioned suppressed literature. I mean, there's the whole Gnostic uh, Christianity, which right. which uh, had a lot to say about all this, but was repressed right. back in the early days. And there's been a revival of this, uh, catalyzed, I think, by the emergence of teachers from the East. And what's one of the things that's interesting about it is it's also being democratized. So there's people de teaching Kabbalah and Christian contemplative practices. So these things were, you know, very esoteric when they were available at all. It was only for certain select people. And now they're, you know, like just like meditation, TM became available, you know, to, to anybody who wanted it. Mm -hmm. uh, these other teachings are now being democratized. And, and that's, that's what's happening. But what you, you also reminded me of is it's not just the, the religions that are being transformed by this. So is... Uh, the secular disciplines. So the the um, 
the delineations you spoke of, this investigation of, this, of consciousness by the East, the systematic investigation of consciousness, is influencing psychology and neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So our understanding of consciousness, our understanding of human development in, uh, through the, the, the evolution of, of psychology as a discipline and all the, the mind sciences, that has been powerfully affected by, by the emergence of these teachings and the sort of cutting edge of psychology or you know, and cognitive science and, and neuroscience and all that is you know has been influenced by the um, uh, the theoretical models you could say of of the literature from Buddhism and Hinduism for 40 years now ever since you know the teachings became more more available. Yeah, you know, growing up in a sort of a TM culture, uh, you know, we were both conversant with the scientific research on meditation, but um, you know, I've never explored that aspect too much outside the TM culture. Um, of the, I'm exploring sort of teachers and teachings, but I've never really looked much at the research. Right. I mean, if you had a whole map of the of the kind of research you're talking about in physiology and psychology, how how big of a a, a circle on that map would the TM research be? Oh, it's big. Mm -hmm. It's big. It, it set the prototype. I, I've interviewed over the years a, a number of people involved in in uh, transpersonal psychology and in uh, consciousness research and so forth. The people who read, you know, scientific journals and go to go to conferences and all that. And um, my sense is that over the years they've recognized the uh, TM research as truly groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, this this was you know the, it, it set the tone. I mean, Keith Wallace's research and then the subsequent research he did with Benson um, that got it, the whole thing off the ground. Mm -hmm. And th there's a lot of well, I have to be honest that there's a there are mixed feelings about the TM research in those or in those uh, circles that outside of the TM scientists. One, um, they recognize the in the uh, a, a ma amazing amount of research that's done and recognize most of it as making an important contribution. They have sometimes been critical of the way the results are presented and interpreted, th accusing the TM scientists of, of proselytizing and calling their objectivity into question because, you know, for obvious reasons. And, you know, people have said to me, well, you know, if I read a study from a pharmaceutical company, I, I take it you know, I, I'm a little more skeptical, and and so pe anybody representing an institution that has something uh, they're promoting is going to be seen with more skepticism. And so some of the TM research is held with a sort of arm's length uh, cynicism, but most of it is is you know been peer reviewed and so forth, and they accept it as uh, true. They, it's the claims to uh, the, some. Some of the way they're interpreted has, has often uh, and promoted has, has ruffled feathers. But there's also been a tremendous amount of research on other practices. And one of the, one of the interesting things now is, you know, people like you and me in the, in the early 70s were presenting this research and, and were very upset that uh, the research done on TM was being generalized to any old form of meditation. And we would say, no, it, you know, not all forms of meditation are the same. And the science is finally coming around to that. You right. Know, they're, finally, they're finally realizing you can't make those generalizations, and they're doing comparative studies of different forms of meditation and um, sort of validating you know, what the TM scientists have been arguing all along, that you, you can, you know, there are different forms, they have different effects, and you have to be, uh, you have to distinguish among them, and, and that's now part of the literature. Well, the TM scientists have been arguing that ours is the best, and they, a lot of times the research is used to try to prove that, but I mean, our, I imagine that scientists outside the, the TM world are not necessarily coming to that conclusion, they're just saying there are differences. That's the more objective way of stating it. They, you know, they well, but they might say one is superior to the other for certain things. Right. So if you do a blood pressure test and 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 one form you know, lowers blood pressure more than another, that's a valid conclusion to come to. Mm -hmm. But uh, with respect to other things, you know, the, that's one of the things that has ruffled feathers. It's that. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that kind of gets us back to the different strokes for different folks theme of the Vedic you know, civilization, which is that, you know, the, the, the masters, the teachers realize that different people have different temperaments and right. different That's practices right. are going to be suitable for different people. And for different purposes. Right. And, and it could very well be that some of the practices being studied uh, work well in combination with one another, mm -hmm. you know, because there are certain forms that, uh, you know, involve uh, contemplation on content and certain forms that involve uh, what we used to say is not good for meditation, concentration, mm -hmm. which in, in its context, isolated from the, uh, the uh, imperative to transcend and to, to, to transcend thought that, that you know, there may be some value in, in training the mind or whatever it is. So, so we're learning that there may be uh, meditative practices, yogic practices that um, have you know different values for different purposes. Yeah, well, good point. Um, so let's uh, let's continue our sort of uh, timeline here. We 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 kind of touched upon Emerson and and uh, we didn't mention Thoreau, but people usually mention them in the same breath, and we everyone knows quite a bit about what he you know contributed. Uh, and then we have Swami Vivekananda. I don't know if that's that's the next major chapter in your yeah, yeah. In, in your book. And and then we get into the whole crop of public intellectuals, you know, Houston Smith and Aldous Huxley and uh, and these guys. Is there anything you want to comment about any yeah, any and, of those people and, so far? And and there in the structure of my book, I I broke with chronology mm -hmm. because I wanted to show early on these um, threads of transmission. And um, so I did a chapter on Vivekananda, who was the, f the sort of Jackie Robinson of the story, the first, <laughs> you know, to break through and, and right. you know, come here and have an effect. And, and he created the Vedanta societies, which are still going strong. Um, and the Swamis who came to um, uh, run the, the, the uh, head up the Vedanta society uh, centers in America became mentors especially in the 40s and 50s, to young intellectuals, Westerners, who went on to have a huge impact on the culture. So I wanted to show that early on, so I skipped ahead a little bit to the 40s and 50s, and then went back to Yogananda's arrival in the 20s. But th when you think of... In, in the L.A., for example, the, the Swami uh, Brahmavananda, who was running the Vedanta Center here, Aldous Huxley, Christopher Isherwood, and Gerald Hurd were hanging around as, as <clears throat> young seekers. They were already well-known in Britain. They started publishing books that probably many of us read in the 60s and 70s, early translations of the Yoga Sutras and the, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, um, other books, anthologies of writings about Vedanta by Western authors, a journal. These had a huge impact uh, in, in prior to the wave of gurus that came in the 60s and 70s and are still being read. And, and, when, and then when you think about them going on and Huxley going on to write the perennial philosophy and Isherwood going on to write a book about Ramakrishna and about you know novels about where, where the the characters are seekers, uh, you know, who are practicing these uh, Eastern practices. And then in, in St. Louis, the Swami who running the Vedanta Center was mentoring Houston Smith, who went on and wrote the, the most uh, important uh, comparative religion textbook in, in the last 50 years and, and is, you know, a, a sort of giant of religious scholarship. And in New York, Joseph Campbell was was mentored by uh, Swami Nikolananda, and he went on to, to, to do all of his work, all informed by Vedantic teachings. And incidentally, also in New York at that time, it was J.D. Salinger hanging around the Vedanta Society and being informed. And if you read uh, all of his work subsequent to, to Catcher in the Rye, you see a sort of uh, Eastern Mysticism 101 permeating all the writings, and these people reached millions and millions of people, um, and so and then in turn they influenced people like other scholars and other you know novelists or whatever, who also influence others, and that's how these the at least the the kernel of the teachings spread. 
So that's that's why that chapter is there. And then I think the the next major um, a sort of uh, uh, incidents, uh, inciting incidents, as they say in Hollywood, was when Yogananda came in the 20s and uh, settled here, become the first major guru to live here and uh, set up his self-realization uh, fellowships and, of course, write the autobiography of a yogi, which was probably the most influential book in uh, <clears throat> turning people on to Eastern, Eastern teachings, at least among the people I interviewed. Actually, you know, since we're talking about all these authors, we could rewind the clock a little bit and mention Mark Twain, who went, yeah. you know, at one point was the most famous man in the world and certainly the most famous author, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. and who went to India and was went very impressed. India. And some of his le- later books actually contain a very mystical theme. There's one book, I forget mm-hmm. the title of it, where the, the, there's this boy who performs siddhis and uh, huh. you know, there's all kinds of interesting things that, that came out from his having visited India. Yet another thing uh, that didn't get into my book, I'll have to put on the website. Yeah, <laughs> but I do mention that he wrote, he went to India, and, and his journals of, of writings from India were published, and you know, mm-hmm. the, gave a lot of people their first glimpse of at least Indian culture, if not uh, the spiritual component. Yeah, um, so Yogananda, he he definitely had an impact and spanned. Uh, he was in the U.S. for a number of decades. Number thirty-two of, years he lived yeah. here long time and uh, any, you want to say anything about him in passing or do well, we? Well it's, it's principally the autobiography of a yogi that had a huge impact. I yeah. mean going back to when I think of the remember the 60s you know most people I knew who were busy being seekers had read that book at one time and, right. and passed it around to their friends and so forth but he also was very innovative he was a great example of somebody holding firm to tradition while also adapting to western culture because mm-hmm. back in his early days he started distributing some of the teachings that were only given uh, one-on-one through mail order, right? <laughs> which was the kind of internet of its day. You, know, you signed up for lessons, and they came every week or two in the mail yeah. on your doorstep. And this was, you know, you think about the innovation of that. And then, you know, later when <clears throat> when Maharishi and and the and the gurus of the 60s and 70s came, you know, they had television and videotape, and then later. You know the internet, uh, so yeah, he was. They were all kind of innovative and and cutting edge. Yeah, and he was. He was an early example of it. My in- introduction to this sort of thing happened uh, initially at prep school. I went to prep school for a year because my parents felt it might get me away from taking drugs. That's <laughs> where I first got stoned. Was at prep school, but um, <laughs> uh, my 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 roommate started mentioning yoga, and somehow that rang a bell in my mind. Yeah, yoga. That sounds interesting. And then that summer, I was driving down the post road in Westport, Connecticut, with three friends in the car, and one of them in the back seat was reading from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, translated by Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought, wow. Enlightenment. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, there is. I realized, oh, there is such a thing. You know, and so there again was that that Eastern influence. And then after about a year of fooling around, I learned to meditate. Yeah, and and uh, needless to say, you were not the only one. <laughs> right. Who, who had that pattern? <laughs> right. Right. And and, and Ramdas, the former Richard Alpert, was mm-hmm. kind of the prototype of that. And and you know. Uh, the most famous uh, of people who had that pattern of seeking and drug taking and reading and then settling into uh, an authentic spiritual pursuit. Yeah. Um, all right. So your book moves on. You're talking about beatniks, hippies. This is the part I haven't read yet. Um, consciousness <laughs> expanders. But we're sort of alluding to that now in, in terms yeah, of the whole yeah. the whole drug culture, which everything changed then. Yeah. Which you know had a sort of a uh, spiritual justification in some people's minds, you know. I mean, they 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 sort of ostensibly were doing it for some kind of inner exploration. Although many people got totally absorbed in just the, yeah. getting their kicks. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I mean, when when Marshy came along, um, his whole emphasis was to uh, you know clean everybody up, and and you know, I think he successfully did that with a lot of people. Oh, you bet. You know, it's. I think of the um, um, the three main 
influence, that the three big teachers, the one who get the, get the most space in the book, were Vivekananda, Yogananda, and Maharishi, mm -hmm. just ju going by their sheer impact on the culture. Right. And the time frame, I think of the, the sort of story I tell in American Veda as having, um, uh, there's the pre-Beatles in India phase and the post-Beatles in India phase. Mm -hmm. That was a watershed moment. Now, uh, a lot was going on in, in Maharishi's teaching and the TM world that made the Beatles possible. Um, and so we don't want to detract from the hard work that was done by the early TM teachers and by Maharishi himself and by Jerry Jarvis and all those people. When you say made them possible, you mean made it possible for them to find Maharishi. That's exactly right. Right, right. Yeah. And, and because it started to be popular among young people in, in U U.S. and U.K. before the Beatles. It right. Was, it, was, it was being happening on college campuses to a certain extent. And so the word was out mm -hmm. that you could do this practice. But <clears throat> in what was most interesting, as somebody who thought that that part of the book would be the easiest thing to write, because I lived through it, you know, having been initiated into TM in 68, and uh, my introductory lecture was when Maharishi appeared at Harvard, uh, you know, after, you know in, in the early part of 68, famous uh, lecture, mm -hmm. although I couldn't get in, I had to watch it on television, um, but um, I thought I knew that period, but doing my due diligence and doing my research, uh, I, it, was, it blew my mind to go back and read the newspaper coverage and the magazines of the time. It was phenomenal, the amount of publicity that came about when the Beatles met Maharishi and learned about. And of course, a lot of it was on television, so you could even see a lot of stuff on YouTube now. Mm -hmm. um, it was relentless. And then it got even bigger when they announced they were going to India and you know, repor reporters and journalists were, were you know, encircling uh, the ashram in Rishikesh. It was months and months of front page coverage, n n major magazine cover stories. It was enormous. And what was most interesting was reading the, the texts of some of the journalism. It was far more sympathetic to Maharishi and meditation in general than you, and India, and Indian stuff in general, than I, I'd remember. Because of course there was also cynical reporting. But the, the main reason for the sympathetic tone was, oh, these young people are cleaning up their acts. Ah. All the, you know, these people, these hippies and dropouts that, whose parents were so worried about them, um, it looks like you know they're they're now saying, oh, I don't do drugs anymore. I meditate. So maybe this is a good <laughs> thing after all. And, and there were there would be interviews with parents saying, you know, I don't know. When he first you know went to India, when he first met this guru, I thought it was so weird, and I was worried about it. But look, now he's nice to me, and now he's going back to school, and now he cut his hair, or, you know, whatever it was. And, but the main thing was not drugs. So if you look at a lot of the headlines, it was uh, guru, gets uh, get, guru gets young people off drugs. I'll and tell you a funny instead. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, this must have been in the spring of 68 before I had learned to meditate. And uh, I, some friends and I sat in, in my car um, smoking dope for <laughs> an hour or so. And then Totally Stone drove into town to get a burger or something, you know. And I ran a red light because I was so out of it. And the cop, a cop almost hit me. So he <laughs> pulled me over right away. And he, you know, he, I rolled down the window. He said, oh, God, you guys smell like you've had a fix. And uh, <laughs> I said, oh, no, officer. We don't do drugs anymore. We practice transcendental meditation. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> that's but, but I hadn't learned yet. <laughs> well, and then, right, since we're being confessional. When I couldn't get in to see Maharishi speak at Harvard, they announced that the local PBS station was going to air it on TV that week. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of people came over to my apartment to smoke dope and watch the guru. <laughs> and funny. that was my introductory lecture. Yeah. You know.
And, um, <laughs> but then after I'd been doing it for a few months and had, like you say, totally cleaned up my act. I mean, I had dropped out of high school. My father had kicked me out of the house. Within two weeks after I'd learned, I was, I'd got cut my hair, got a job, you know, got back into school, doing all this stuff. My father, after a couple of months, said, I don't know what you're doing, but I want to do it too. You might remember yeah. my father. And that's, uh, yes, I do. And yeah. that happened a lot. Yeah. And as we all know, first of all, you'll find the, those sections quite nostalgic. Yeah. It'll bring back your youth. But, <laughs> uh, but, hey, I haven't um, lost it. No. <laughs> Mem good memories. But um, within, as we know, uh, and this is a point I make in my talks that, that is very important to convey. Because of what we were just talking about, serious grown-ups started looking at what was going on with meditation. That stimulated a lot of the interest from scientists and psychologists to say, what is going on? Why are these people being transformed by this practice? And that led to the mainstreaming of TM. So by 1975, when we had the Merv Griffin phenomenon, now we had, instead of the sort of counterculture heroes of the Beatles, we had mainstream heroes advocating TM. Mary Tyler Moore and Clint Eastwood, mm -hmm. you know, two bigger you know, stars you could not imagine at the time. And, and, you know, America's sort of favorite talk show host saying he's a meditator. This was huge. And so it was kind of a very rapid evolution from hippies turning, going away from LSD into meditation to ordinary Americans getting off Valium <laughs> and, and, you know, to, to, to meditate instead. This was a huge, huge thing and not to be underestimated. It's true. I mean, it happened within five or six years, and, and you know, and the most of the, most of the fifty thousand or so people who were coming in to learn every month after the Merv Griffin show were truck drivers and housewives, and you know, just pe right. people who wouldn't have gone anywhere near LSD or anything. They were just sort of looking to lower their stress levels. That's right. And so you had this mainstreaming of meditation. And with it, the, the sort of mainstreaming of that India has something legitimate to teach us and that the, uh, the conceptual framework that comes with meditation and comes with these practices is something to be taken seriously. And that you know, started to have a huge transformative effect on, on psychology, on medicine. Uh, and it's not just, you know, it, and it opened the doors. I call, in the book, I call Maharishi the sort of Henry Ford of, of American Veda because he mainstreamed the practice of meditation. Meditation became legitimate. You know, we would think of it as TM, but the general term, meditation, because it opened the door to all the other gurus to and, and all the other teaching lineages to have more customers because now it was legitimate. And so people who weren't drawn to TM uh, a lot of the leadership of the Vedanta Society, of SRF, of the Integral Yoga Institute, of uh, Muktananda's lineage, all these other you know, current leaders were people who were influenced in those days to, to look to uh, Indian spiritual teachings and found their way to whatever you know, was appropriate for them. It seems to me that... I mean, I've, I've been a little bit obsessed with this topic over the last 10 years, but it seems to me that um, it's almost the exception rather, uh, to find a, a teacher from the East who hasn't been embroiled in some sort of scandal or controversy like this. Some of them managed to keep it very private. Others, it, it just blew wide open. But yeah. it, it, it puzzles me, and I've given it a lot of thought. I, I sort of feel like perhaps the reason, and you see what you think about this, is that the culture in which these teachers grew up didn't prepare them to deal with being surrounded by beautiful young women and lots of money and stuff like that. They may have grown up in an ashram and just didn't, you know, they, they had issues that they didn't even know they had and, and may very well have uh, reached a very high level of consciousness, however we want to define that, um, but had shadow issues that hadn't been dealt with and that were triggered by the proximity of these temptations. Uh, I agree with you. Everything you say, especially back in the 70s, um, and, you know, 
I think your analysis is probably true, but one of the takeaways from this, and of course you're not the only person who has thought about this stuff, it has given rise uh, to a lot of interesting thinking, you know, especially in, in uh, circles of people who are both uh, spiritual practitioners and uh, intellectual psychologists and people like that have, have given a lot of, uh, people like Ken Wilber have given a lot of thought to it and written about it. And, and one of the conclusions I think we have come to is that enlightenment uh, doesn't necessarily uh, imply a one-to-one a -one correspondence with what we think of as moral or ethical behavior. And, and that people can achieve higher levels of consciousness and uh, still misbehave or still find, you know, those shadow elements uh, are present and, um, and, and the whole humanness of the experience and the, um, the unreasonable expectations uh, that we project onto people of, of spiritual stature has uh, come into focus uh, over the last few decades, and I think we're a lot more mature about that now as a result. Mm. Which is not to, by the way, uh, you know, downplay the, the, the wounds that these scandals created and the disillusionment and the hurt and the pain. There was an awful lot of that, and it's still there for a lot of people. Yeah. Um. It took me a long time to adjust to that idea because Marshi, you know, who is my teacher, emphasized so much that there is a tight correlation between ethical and moral, moral development and development of consciousness. He always said people act from their level of consciousness. Right. Uh, but the I've I had to accept that the correlation is a lot looser than I once thought. Yeah, and I think there probably is some correlation. You know, because you know, I think you're, you, the odds of behaving morally and ethically improve when you, <laughs> as you advance spiritually. But it's not a one-to-one -one thing. It's not like a, a train where you know consciousness is the locomotive and and behavior in the world and and moral behavior, uh, uh, business acumen, you know, uh, or any of these kind of uh, uh, relative qualities are, are the are the cars that get dragged along with it. It just doesn't seem to be that way. Yeah, yeah. And there is that shadow element that we you know carry with us, and our humanness, and our physicalness, and our bodies. I mean, all these things are factors that can't be dismissed. And and this, but I think you know the tendency to uh, elevate gurus to a certain level and to, uh, to take a surrender to a guru or a, um, a humility to a, a great teacher to the extreme of believing everything they say uh, or of assuming everything they say is true and there's a certain infallibility quality to it. I think you know that we've learned better. Another thing people fail to do I think is to discriminate between what the guru is what what the guru is saying, which may only be a reflection of his particular opinion or cultural devel right. development, and what he's saying that might have some universal truth quality to it. You know, like if, if for instance, a guru makes some comment about politics or or uh, <laughs> or something, does that right. is that really cosmic intelligence uh, exactly. offering opinion about politics, or is that just yeah. you know his added his opinion? And the and the whole notion of um, uh, gurus don't make mistakes, that everything they do is in line with divine intelligence or God's will or whatever the, the motif is. Uh, and, you know, and psychologists call that the halo effect, halo effect, and they've been using that term long before there were gurus. I mean, when people like Edison and Einstein were around, they were always asked their opinion about social things and cultural things and politics because they were geniuses in their field. Yeah. And, and, and there's this assumption that that would ca genius would carry over. So why should we uh, we make the same assumption about a spiritual genius or philosophical genius or, or good, you know, charismatic teaching skills? But it's even more so with gurus because there's this spiritual sense of surrender and perfectibility that we um, mistakenly. Uh, allowed to cross over to, to those fields. So, you know, you're right. Gurus are also products of their culture. 
I remember, you know, when I was troubled over some of the things Maharishi was saying about world affairs or, or some of the policies of the movement, you know, one person who shall be nameless said to me, well, he's Indian. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, <laughs> yes, he's from India. Yeah. He's not only from India, he was of a different generation. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, a, a totally different lifestyle and, and cultural milieu. So, you know, of course he's going to see certain things differently and do things differently. Why do we assume it's necessarily appropriate or correct or mistake-free? <laughs> I think the confusing thing about gurus, though, is that uh, you know, whereas with Edison or Einstein, you know, they were scientists, and we don't necessarily expect scientists to be saints. But, right. but, but a guru is associated with higher states of consciousness, quote unquote, which uh, is associated with saintliness. You know, we we picture right. Christ walking on water or something, right. and, and you know, and and saying, "Be therefore perfect." And so, and, and so we, yeah. and, and and some gurus, Marshi in particular, is explicitly taught. That uh, you know, if you get enlightened, you're not going to be able to make mistakes. You know, mistake-free life, not violating laws of nature, yada yada. And and but then it then we it's incumbent upon us to ask the question: What does that mean? What does it mean not to make mistakes in the cosmic sense? What is the what does it mean when you we try to you try to apply that principle, even if you assume it's true, which I don't. But if you if you assume it's true. What does it mean to about when you apply it to life in the relative world? Does it, you know, there's a million stories of Maharishi complaining to people about why didn't they tell him he ha he was wrong about something? Yeah. Well, they didn't tell him because they assumed he couldn't be wrong. He said that to me one time. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I've I heard him say, "Oh, I made a mistake. I should have done this." Well, yeah. you know, where's the there's cognitive dissonance there that people did not want to look at, and. <laughs> Well, the funny it thing is, just Marishi, I must tell oh, no. you, it, it was in all the other movements. Uh, as well. Absolutely. Uh, the thing is, though, I mean, if you read the Vedic literature, the Puranas, they're full of wacky stories, you know, of of saints and sages and Maharishis and Brahma Rishis and what whatnot going at each other, you know, battling and and doing all kinds of crazy stuff that doesn't fit into our concept of morality. They're human, and and so. This is a big lesson, and, and in my experience, the young practitioners now, the young seekers, even the ones who are around gurus and love their guru, uh, they, they're not quite in the same, they're not making the same mistakes, maybe because they saw their older siblings or their parents go through what we're talking about. They're more likely to have a sensible attitude toward their gurus or their teachers, one that is, you know, uh, does not make these assumptions of infallibility and perfection and uh, ob n n obedience uh, that um, many, many people of our generation did. I'm sure they're still doing some of that. But uh, there's also, I think, less um, likelihood of, of sexual shenanigans nowadays, in part because a lot of, there's a lot of female gurus now. Yeah, and then, and they, you know they're not testosterone driven in their <laughs> bodies in the same way, but, but also be because we've we've all learned a lot about you know there's precautionary tales about the inappropriateness of that kind of intimacy of you know teachers and students and and people in authority and so forth, so it's different. Yeah, and also I mean some of the teachers are much more kind of down to earth they're not trying to create too much of an aura around themselves like Adyashanti for instance and mm -hmm. you know kind of matter of fact and um, and, also, and and in cases where there have been faux pas there, there has in some cases been very kind of honest um, forthcoming and evaluation of it like for instance right. uh, Gangaji's husband what's his name that's right um, right but the difference, Rick, when you, the, with the people you just mentioned, is these are not people who took vows of celibacy. Uh, they, they were not swamis. They, they, they were not representing a tradition where brahmacharya was held up to be an ideal, and they did not ask that of their followers. Good point. I think a, a big part of the 70s scandals was the hypocrisy yeah. and, and, the, and the delusionary kind of quality and the sneaking around and the denial and all the rest of that kind of cover-up stuff that came with it. Yeah, good point. I was interviewing Genpo Roshi a couple of weeks ago. Do you know him? Yes. And uh, 
I didn't know it. At, yeah, I didn't know it at the time, but I, I looked him up on Wikipedia late, later and found out there had actually been some scandal in his life. Um, <laughs> I, don't not, I, don't, I don't know what the, the gist of it was, and I won't pass judgment on it. But it, in the interview, he was saying how you know he saw this kind of fall that gurus take as a step in their progress rather than a regression. It's sort of like it forces it, it forces them to kind of face things that they hadn't. It could very well face. be, but, but they didn't all face it. True. At least not publicly, anyway. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. And, you know, to this day, I mean, I can't tell you how bad. I mean, this was the hardest stuff for me to write in the book because, you know, it's so complicated and I didn't want it to be too sensationalized and I didn't want it to overwhelm, you know, the other stuff because it's so titillating. And, but, but I talked to a lot of people in all the organizations where there were scandals or where there were at least allegations. And the range of uh, reaction to this stuff, to this day, 30, 40 years later, is extraordinary. There's still people who will not accept that it possibly could have happened. Mm -hmm. And on the other extreme, there are people who have renounced you know, everything about gurus and Indian teachings and so forth. But most people in the, in the middle of this sort of bell curve just mature to a perspective where they realize it was... It is always about the teaching, not the teacher, and it always should have been about the teachings and not the teacher, and and that's what they've come back to. Hmm. Uh, what what the? Yeah, my teacher may have had a fall. He may have done these things, but it does not change what I got from these teachings and practices that uh, he he brought to my life. Yeah, that's that's my attitude. <laughs> yeah, yes, ex exactly, and and I think that's the maturation that took place, um, you know. And some of these things surfaced after the guru had passed from the earth, and so we don't know that yeah. they would ever have, you know, faced up to it. Yeah. And to this day, there are some things that we we just don't know if they're true or not. Uh, yeah, and you know, I notice that neither of us is naming names here, and I think it's better that way in a sense because yeah. I, my attitude is not to sort of shove this in people's faces. If they're curious and they want to research it, they can find out things about their particular teacher or any particular teacher, you know. But oh uh, man, you will. There's no shortage of, of of stuff about all this on the internet. Oh yeah, and and in in the book, I had to name a couple. I only named a couple of names where there was a lot of publicity around it, and yeah. so it's, you know people know about it, or or where there was something about what happened that needed to be uh, that was unique and needed to be expressed, like when Amrit Desai's scandal happened, and they were it was confronted in a grown-up and mature way, mm -hmm. and the result of that was the Kripalu Institute, which is the biggest yoga, residential yoga center in America now, and converted from a guru-centered organization to a, a non-profit educational model and has thrived ever since. Yeah. And, and so that was worth mentioning because it was very public and, and, and there's lessons to be drawn. But I, I tried to stay away from all the other things where you know, you had to mention that there were allegations, but I, I, I'm not. I was not going to go investigating what was true and what was not. Right. Okay. Um, so you go on in the book to talk about the sort of the the spin-offs from some of these Indian teachers, Ramdas, Deepak, and other American uh, acharyas. Take the wheel, you say. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and some some people who became actual gurus with you know disciples who were Americans and, and others who became scholars and others who became psychologists or whatever. I call them all the Vedic transmitters. Like Andrew Cohen you're probably referring to and yes. Ken, Ken Wilbur and so on. Right. All of those people are mentioned or you know profiled and given some time in the book because they all made contributions in their own way. Mm -hmm. And then you also covered uh, the, uh, the impact that um, the in, that India has had on music and, uh, and the arts. Well, I, I focus more not on necessarily, yes, it's about the impact India had on, on music and the, and the other mm -hmm. arts, but more how the arts became means of transmission. Uh -huh. And artists became means of transmission. And the, the, the principal one being Ravi Shankar. Right. Uh, and, and his impact on, <clears throat> excuse me, classical and jazz musicians, but principally uh, George Harrison and through George, of course. You know, tremendous amount of transmission because of his interest uh, in in the spiritual component of Indian music, and he you know became the 
the, 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 the true seeker among you know, the, the Beatles and, and um, a, a transmitter in his own right, mm -hmm. but also people like T.S. Eliot and, <clears throat> and William Butler Yeats and Salinger and Somerset Maugham and Herman Hesse and Yehudi Menuhin and John Coltrane and you know and a lot of other people. John McLaughlin, the Mahavishnu John Orchestra. McLaughlin, that's right, and a lot of those people who learned from Indian teachers and transmitted the teachings in some form or another through their art, including filmmakers. You know the the, the, the you know the films like Gandhi and and Satyajit Ray's Apu trilogy. These things, you know, in some subtle way and in some overt ways influence people in the direction of looking deeper into s Indian spiritual teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a With lot of fun to write that chapter. Within You, Without You certainly had an impact on me listening to that. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> Beatles song. That's right. Uh, hmm. All right. So um, we, we are sort of going through your book in a linear fashion, but it's kind of working. Uh, <laughs> your, your next chapter here is The Soul of Science, The Science of Soul. Yeah. What's that about? Well, we touched upon oh, this scientific early. research. Not it, it, one part of it is the, the the impact of all the scientific research that started with the TM research and mm -hmm. has now evolved into you know a lot of studies on hatha yoga and various forms of meditation and and of course the the brain imaging uh, techniques that are so much more sophisticated than they were you know back in in the early 70s. But that's one part of it. The other part is the impact on certain sort of cutting edge uh, theoretical physicists. And, and I, I don't just mean John Hagelin, I mean, you know, people like Heisenberg and, and Schrodinger mm -hmm. and uh, other, other uh, physicists and <coughs> earlier Tesla. It turns out that Nikola Tesla was friends with Vivekananda and they, mm -hmm. they had a lot of interaction between them. So that sort of. Uh, Eastern cosmology, Western science thing was going on back in the 1890s, mm -hmm. and it, it progressed, you know, obviously into the modern age. Um, and and then you know people like Fritz Kapper who Kapper who wrote the, the Tao of Physics, and and other people who are looking into the connection between uh, the consciousness sciences of, of the East and and modern uh, cosmology and and physics and consciousness research. And also um, the effect that science has now had as a means of transmission. So you have people who, for whom Eastern practices were mainly uh, conceived of as mind-body practices or as um, adding levels of understanding to, our un uh, to what we think of as human potential. So I, uh, there's a section about developmental psychology and people and, and Skip Alexander, who many of your listeners know, is, it was a, a, a part of that. Mm -hmm. And people like Ken Wilbur and other psychologists who are taking developmental psychology to higher levels of what's possible for human beings because of the models that came to us from India, and and also uh, health research. You know the the. Uh, practices in alternative medicine, people meditating and doing yoga for uh, yoga therapy and uh, uh, mind-body uh, sort of integration, people like Dean Ornish and Mehmet Oz, all affected by uh, the, the the yogic practices and yogic teachings. Mehmet uh, Oz learned TM recently, by the way. I know he did. I was yeah. interviewed by him. Uh, oh. That didn't come up, but I know he, he learned TM recently, but he was also... Uh, uh, practicing uh, hatha yoga for many years, mm -hmm. and and as and Dean Ornish, Dean Ornish modeled his whole research protocol off of what he learned from his guru, who was Swami Satchidananda, mm -hmm. and he sort of kept that quiet for a long time, but was very eager to give Satchidananda credit and to honor him when I interviewed him for the book. And mm -hmm. so you know now he can he can call his practice you know the, the, some of the components of what he does. Yoga, <laughs> whereas before it was you know stretching exercises, <laughs> you know, so so these things have become mainstream through uh, scientists who were influenced by the teachings early in their career. Mm -hmm. Okay.
It's interesting. So this this next chapter, a priest, a minister, and a rabbi walk into an ashram. I presume that's about <laughs> about the sort of the the, uh, de- the deepening of Western religions by virtue of the Eastern influence that we were talking about earlier. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so there, are people like Thomas Merton and Bede Griffiths and uh, the Jewish equivalents and and the the Christian mystics. And there's a whole section there about the origins of centering prayer. Uh, with Thomas Keating when he was bringing TM teachers up to uh, Spencer Monastery, the monastery in Spencer Mass, and also some Buddhist teachers uh, to to figure out what was going on with these practices. The ultimate mm-hmm. result of which was the development of centering prayer. Hmm. Um, and your final chapter, the once and future religion, America, the spiritual evolved. It sounds like you're going to prognosticate in that one. Uh, what are you doing there? A little bit. I'm I'm, re- I'm reluctant to do that because I, you know, I'm not a seer. But I'm just looking at trends. If you, you know, I did a lot of looking into all the research on just religious trends, especially in the last, since the 60s and 70s, and and you could see patterns in all the surveys that were taken by, uh, you know. Princeton and the Pew Research and Gallup polls and all this stuff. And the trend line is clearly in this sort of Vedantic yogic direction, whether people call it that or not. Because one of the contentions I make in the book is that people have been influenced by uh, these teachings, the, 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 the Dharmic teachings, the Enlightenment teachings, uh, including Buddhism, which I don't cover in the book, but the, the, the what we think of as the yogic tradition or the Hindu tradition, um, in w- in ways they don't even realize. They don't even know they're being affected by this, because you know they learn it something from a self-help author like John Gray, who many of them, <laughs> or, yeah. or Deepak, or or any of a number of others, or they learn something from their psychotherapist or from a a, a new book on psychology or whatever it is. Um, not knowing that the authors and the, the, the seminar leaders have been powerfully influenced by these teachings and sort of changed the language so that there's, there doesn't seem to be anything Indian about it. Yeah. Um, and, and so these things have permeated the culture in, in many, many ways. And, and that's one of the big points I make. So the notion that uh, spiritual you can be spiritual uh, and not conventionally religious that you can carve out your own individual path according to your inclinations and your uh, personality and so forth. And that you, um, the, f- the focal point of your, your spiritual life can be the inner experience of the divine or of God or whatever, you know, how you define that. This has become mainstream. And this is the direction that the research shows uh, people's uh, attitudes toward religion and uh, 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 spirituality has moved even among conventionally religious people. They will say that their church affiliation is less important than their inner experience. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is a trend line. And they will say they're open to learning from other traditions and other ways of looking at religion and spirituality. They will conscientiously uh, apl- learn from, from uh, or, or seek out uh, wisdom from other traditions. And above all, they are much more uh, accepting of different spiritual pathways as legitimate. So this move away from my way is the only way and my tradition is the one true way has has um, disintegrated rapidly before our eyes. There are still the fanatics and exclusivists out there making a lot of noise, and there probably always will be, but their numbers are less and less. So that's the kind of trend I look at. I also look at the, the you know, in the last chapter at the current wave of what is uh, sort of fashionable and trendy in, or the ne- the new trend line in just the the Vedic tradition. So I talk about the emergence of Hatha Yoga as a phenomenon and the, the sort of yoga studios as a centerpiece for where young people are going for their uh, spiritual nourishment and the emergence of a kirtan as a major phenomenon, mm-hmm. uh, you know, people chanting all over the place, mm-hmm. doing you know, Sanskrit chants and, they're, you know, being you know, sort of kirtan superstars like uh, Krishnadas and Wah and people like that. Mm-hmm. 
that's an interesting phenomenon because it's sort of people becoming more devotional and the sort of bhakti element uh, is coming out more and more to balance out you know the gyani kind of um, uh, intellectual aspect so I, I talk about these trends and some of the newer gurus like Amma and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar who, are, who have emerged since the 80s have you given much thought to the whole Neo-Advaita movement as it's called yeah, what's, what's your take on, on that well, I have mixed feelings about it because, I, on the one hand, it's it's fascinating that uh, non-dualism is has become a, a commonly accepted term, and there's all these teachers teaching a kind of non-sectarian uh, non-dualism, which I think has tremendous impact and and importance. On the other hand, I take a lot of exception to way some of these teachings are being uh, um, um, interpreted and uh, how people like Ramana Maharshi are being uh, sort of evoked in ways I think that do not do justice to who they really were and do not, you know, uh, are not accurate in their, in their interpretation of, of what they stood for and what they were teaching. And primarily, it's the attitude I saw among a lot of the Neo-Advaita teachers uh, to um, honor the sort of absolute, you know, to 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 disengage from what we think of as the relative and to to discount relative experience and it's a, it's a very renunciate oriented way of looking at the world that that sort of takes all the the, the sort of concept of maya and all this is unreal and all this is um, illusion to mean that you shouldn't be concerned about life in the world and that it, you know, it, it has no real value or no meaning, and this is a, it leads to a kind of, I think, a kind of disengagement that is that is false and and lead, can lead people astray. But the biggest problem I have is that they started to denigrate spiritual practice. Like you don't need to practice; just sort of snap out of it. You're already enlightened, so why meditate and why why do any of this stuff? Which I think does not do justice to where people are at, and and you know the. Uh, the the importance of these traditional uh, practices. Yeah, it's all very well put. It pretty much echoes what I've been thinking and saying about it, and I, I tend to bring it up in almost every one of these interviews because um, it sort of have a little bee in my bonnet about it. Me um, too. Uh, but but I have to say, from what I can tell, it's it started to change because I think some of those teachers realized uh, that they were they were not um, honoring where their students were at. And they were, you know, leaving out something very important in in the whole, you know, uh, uh, emergence of these te enlightenment teachings. There's a, a one Zen teacher once said, "Enlightenment is an accident, and meditation makes you accident prone." Yeah, I heard that one. And that and that uh, that was always a sort of clever way of saying. Yes, in an absolute sense, we're already enlightened, and, and you know, you, you know, when, once you're enlightened, you realize you don't need to practice, and you're already already there. But that's not where people are, and you, you know, there you have to make yourself. You know, it's like Ramakrishna used to say, God, "Grace is everywhere, but you have to set your sails." Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, once you don't catch the wind. Well, in many cases, I think that's not even where these teachers are. I mean, they've gotten an. an I mean, I used to give a pretty good rap when I was 17 about all kinds of, <laughs> you know, spiritual realities, yes. and, and speaking as if I was living from that level, which I wasn't. And you know, I, I think in many cases, I, I I don't know for sure, but I think you know you can get a very intuitive feel for non-dual reality and feel that, okay, well, that's what it's all about. I mean, that's that's the... And you can just start learning to talk from there. Yeah, yeah. But, I'm sure there's a lot of that. Going yeah, on. but if you were somehow able to magically step into the shoes of Ramana Maharshi and see the world through his eyes, you might find there's quite a radical contrast between what you had been experiencing and thinking was enlightenment and what someone like he was experiencing. I, I, I suspect you're quite right about that. <laughs> and to come back to the teaching aspect and, and the, the, the sort of concept of upaya or skillful means, Ramana Maharshi and Nisargadatta did not tell people not to do spiritual practices. Right. They were all for spiritual practices for people you know, on the path. And right. they made that very clear.
<clears throat> yeah. There's a there's a young, uh, very popular Advaita teacher, non dual teacher named Jeff Foster. I don't know if you've heard of him, but I'm I'm gonna yeah. be I'm gonna be interviewing him in a few weeks. And he tells this story about where his, he was taking a walk with his mother and his mother said, oh, look at the beautiful tree. And he went into this whole cold rap about how there is no tree and there is no person and you know, blah, blah <laughs> yada, yada. And, and he said, he looks back at that now and, and kicks himself, you know, thinks, yeah. that, you know, I was very foolish. You know, I, I, oh, good. I'm going good to get him, him to, I'm going to get him to tell that story when I interview him and we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah. But, but well, it, good for him. And I, from what I gather, that's, you know, he's not the only one of the non-dual teachers who have come around, you know, to, to recognize that you know the relative is also uh, part of the picture and part and is absolute, but it is also relative, and that's yeah. yeah. Which in the Vedic knowledge, to my as I understand it, you know, Brahman is said to be the container of both absolute and relative, sort of a yeah. syner synergistic thing where it's more than the sum of its parts. Exactly, and that to me is true non-dualism, not the rejection of relativity. Yeah. Alrighty. So, in terms of your own personal progress and spiritual practice and all that, how's it been going for the last 43 years? <laughs> but, um, speaking of the relative, um, <laughs> um, but I have to say, this is an aside, I'm watching the Skype uh, thing, and, and your picture is frozen. Oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, um, well, you know, it's one learning after another. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, I just continue to try to evolve in the way that's appropriate for me, and um, I've gone through my changes. I will say this because you know, friends of mine out there, you know, my, who might be watching this might wonder, with all my research and everything, um, I still do my TM. Mm -hmm. That is still the centerpiece. And has been, you know, since 1968. It's the it's the centerpiece of my spiritual life, and I value it probably as much or more than I ever did because I'm less naive in my acceptance and and my evaluation of it. And I've, you know, I've I've come around to appreciate Maharishi's contribution and the practice more and more, um, while also coming to respect and value uh, many of the other teachings that have come and the different variations of the Vedantic and yogic uh, uh, traditions and the different teachers who came and what their contribution was. So I've be, I became at a certain point m you know, much more open-minded to learning from other teachings and teachers and much more eclectic in what I do, but TM remains the centerpiece of, of, of my practice uh, and I, I, I find it uh, still indispensable. Um, but I, you know, I also think I, I love going to the kirtan sessions and chanting with the young people. I, you know, it's a it's an outlet for whatever bhakti element is in me. And I, you know, I I've learned to do uh, hatha yoga practices that are beyond the the few asanas we learned back when we were doing residence courses in the 70s. And so, you know, and I've and I learn from other teachers and I learn from other traditions as well. And I just continue my pursuit and and try to you know integrate it with my life in in the world as best I can and there's not a think about it too much there's a saying that uh, you know you can be taking a walk and get caught in a sudden downpour and be drenched or you can be taking a walk in a heavy mist and at a certain point you realize you're drenched but you can't really say <laughs> when it happened it's a very that I I think that's very true and I, every once in a while when people say you know, about, uh, talk about enlightenment. Last night at a, a, t a talk I gave at a bookstore, someone asked, in you know, all my research, because I interviewed like 300 people for my book, how many people did I interview who I thought were enlightened? And I thought, you know, it never even dawned on me to ask that question. I'm not in the business of judging other people's, you know, state of consciousness. And the truth is, I hardly think about my own. Mm -hmm. um, for all I know, I'm walking around in a state of grace or, you know, in a more enlightened state than I give myself credit for. Or maybe the opposite. <laughs> you know, I don't know. And, and I think, you know, thinking about it does not serve me. I just want to sort of live my life and go by how I feel and, and do justice to, you know, the fact that I have some uh, responsibility in the world having been given 
whatever gifts I've been given, uh, you know, from Maharishi and all the other teachers to, to know certain things and to have, a, you know, an ability to write and communicate verbally uh, that, I, you know, I've, I've come to think I have a certain responsibility to, in my own insignificant way, to, to be a transmitter and uh, to enjoy my life and, and presumably progress as quickly as I can. Because one thing I learned when, in the days when I was fanatic about give, getting enlightened, I was probably working against myself by trying too damn hard mm. and, and neglecting other aspects of life that then had to be, you know, I had to make up for. Hmm. Well, that's very well put, and it's probably a good place to conclude. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, 200%. Right. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot, Phil. So this has been great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, you know, it's always great to be interviewed by someone who knows what they're talking about and, and has a great uh, knowledge of the subject. I don't know about that, but um, uh, <laughs> so I've been I've been speaking with uh, Philip Goldberg, who's written a book entitled American Veda, and uh, this is about about the fifty seventh or, or so interview that I've done in this series. Um, if you go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, which is an acronym for Buddha at the gas pump, you'll see them all, and you can participate in discussions, and I'll have links to like Phil's book and his website and, and things like that. Uh, there's a podcast you, you can subscribe to. Um, the, the, view, the videos are in various places, YouTube, Facebook, and so on. But batgap.com is kind of the mothership. Go there, and uh, you can find it all. So... Thanks for li Oh, and there's also a donate button there if you feel like making some small donation. I'm, I use that to sort of upgrade equipment, and you know, like you, you may have noticed, my picture has been frozen during this interview. Uh, something needs to be improved. <laughs> so, but obviously, no obligation. Um, so, thanks for watching or listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>